Okay, welcome everyone to a class on uh, First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Uh, we are studying uh, First Timothy. Uh, anyone knows which chapter we are in? Third, right? Three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, chapter three. Uh, okay. So we're looking at chapter three. Uh, basically, in chapter one, uh, Paul is emphasizing of uh, living in love uh, with a pure heart, clear conscience, and genuine faith. And in chapter two, he's uh, dealing with things in the local church, uh, where he's basically addressing the role of uh, a woman. Um, and we need to understand that when he's addressing these specific um, roles of women in the church at Ephesus it has it's he's addressing it or he's, it has to do uh, with the cultural context in which they were living which means that uh, when Paul says you know uh, you should not come with braided hair expensive clothes or you know uh, uh, pearls it does not mean that women should not uh, dress uh, or should not wear expensive clothes or you know braid their hair or uh, jewelry when they come to church it also does not mean that women need to be uh, silent they cannot have any roles responsibilities in the church no we need to actually interpret it in the cultural context in which uh, uh, you know uh, timothy was living the church at ephesus had existed then and uh, why paul is uh, writing to them so he's addressing uh, this whole issue of women uh, in at uh, at the you know the churches at Ephesus uh, basically has to do with the cultural local context uh, which is surrounded uh, the, so the cultural co context is surrounded around uh, the deity that they used to worship that is Diana and uh, you know the priestess there uh, uh, because it was a female uh, goddess so uh, they had women priests uh, so the women priests uh, were very vocal about the superior superiority of women over men that men uh, women were superior to men and uh, you know they were kind of establishing their superiority uh, in society over men uh, having a say and doing everything uh, in the cultural, religious, um, political, uh, and social environment in at Ephesus, and when you know these people were coming from this pagan background into the church, becoming believers, Paul was saying, "Hey, I don't want you to you know be teaching this heretical teachings uh, because there were priests." Uh, priestess in 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 the temple of Dinah who were preaching and teaching this cultic teachings and you know they were doing various uh, rituals uh, to pronounce curses on men uh, so that they can uh, assume responsibility uh, over men uh, Paul is saying that cannot happen in the church uh, in that context he's saying women have to be silent they cannot teach it does not mean that uh, you know Paul is saying that women cannot teach at all we we see that uh, he uh, has people who are part of his team women who are part of his team who were uh, uh, prophets who were teachers who were uh, co-workers co-laborers uh, one of them also an apostle uh, you know so he had women in his team who were teaching preaching uh, doing the work of the ministry they were flowing in the gifts uh, they were operating in all the gifts they were uh, you know operating in their calling the anointing that god has placed on them but in this specific context he's saying women cannot teach all of these heretical teachings uh, they cannot uh, you know uh, 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 like in the in the cultural context they cannot uh, assume a superiority over men but he mentions the governmental order in the church in the church god's governmental order is that man is the head uh, that women have to walk in submission to uh, men and he explains why uh, but having said this it does not mean that you know it's applicable to us in our in our context or it's also applicable to other churches in a, a, a you know uh, outside Ephesus uh, that women cannot teach preach cannot operate in the gifts because we see uh, you know the church at Corinth uh, uh, you know uh, the women were uh, uh, were uh, you know prophesying they were you know when they met in church they were uh, speaking in tongues interpreting tongues they were prophesying releasing words of wisdom uh, knowledge uh, 
Um, also, we see that women were part of uh, Paul's ministry team, were preaching and teaching and flowing in the gifts. Uh, and we see that also in our present day context, which does not mean that, you know, women should not preach and teach and flow in the gifts or operate in the gifts or in the calling and the anointing. No, it was specific to the church at Ephesus because of their, uh, the local cultural setting that uh, uh, they came from and what was happening there. And in that context, Paul is uh, writing to uh, the women and reminding them of their role and what is the governmental order or structure that God has established in the church. And after that, he addresses um, other things in the local church, like we read in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul basically says, you know, uh, in the church, uh, we have saints who are believers, we have bishops and deacons. Uh, so bishops are basically those who are uh, spiritual leaders and uh, spiritual overseers. Deacons are those who have, uh, you know, are those who uh, are more on the organizational and administrative uh, work, help support uh, staff in the church. So basically, if you think of uh, bishops in our today's context, is people who are, uh, you know, uh, youth pastors, youth mentors, uh, children's church pastors, children's church ministers, uh, people who are leading life groups or leading um, you know, having cell groups um, and teaching in cell groups. So basically, the, we would call them as bishops. Who are the deacons? Basically, those who are volunteering in church and in terms of set up and pack up and those who serve tea or uh, uh, ushering or collecting the offering, whatever. Uh, you know, so these are uh, called deacons. But even if you are in those roles, which we think are, you know, not the roles of an apostle or a preacher or a teacher or a, a missionary, but look at the high standards that uh, uh, that God has for people, even in these roles, even if you're just volunteering in church, even if you're just teaching in children's church, or you're just teaching, uh, ministering, uh, you're part of the core team of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the youth in your church, or you're just having um, a Bible study group, you know, how should you live? So how should you conduct yourselves or what are the qualifications that are required for such people. Uh, this he enlists for us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Uh, so these are basically talking about bishops who are spiritual leaders, spiritual mentors, uh, who, like I said, who in, in our present day are people who are children's church pastors, youth pastors, teaching in um, a children's church or having your own life groups or your own um, you know, cell groups or uh, prayer groups, whatever, uh, you know, what are the qualifications required is what is listed in verses 1 to 7. And um, we looked at that in detail <clears throat> uh, last Monday. And then we moved on to talking about um, um, deacons, which he mentions uh, the qualifications for who a deacon is, how to choose a deacon in, uh, in verses 8 to 13. Yes, say. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, I was just uh, reviewing uh, the whole aspect of bishops, the appointment of bishops again. And when you mentioned it, I just remembered that I was going to ask a question. Um, so basically, what you're saying that Paul is referring to as for bishops or overseer, not necessarily um, pastors or apostles or prophets over a church, but mainly like departmental. Is that what you mean? Like maybe departmental heads who are heading units or different sections of a church because the understanding kind of we kind of have these days is that when someone is called a bishop it's more like someone who oversees a church a whole church or multiple churches but it's like the the real explanation for bishop from what you're saying uh, uh, based on what paul wrote is mainly more of would I say maybe elders or would I say elders or overseers over like certain aspects of the church? Yeah, it, 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 would that be the correct way to interpret it or could it be both? Yes, in this context, it's not uh, what we uh, look at in uh, in our present day, uh, you know, situation, uh, present day context of our churches where we have one bishop who's overseeing uh, so many churches. But here it's talking about when we're talking about uh, bishops here, it's basically talking about the, the categories that I had mentioned uh, 
pertaining to bishops and to deacons. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. So I, I don't know. So I, I don't know if this is out of mind. Then whether the whole aspect of uh, the office of bishops come from over churches. I, I don't know where, where did that all just was it a misuse of what Paul said or misinterpretation? I, I don't know. Because <laughs> I come from an Orthodox background, and I saw this like we had bishops over different churches, you know, and. But now it's a different understanding from what you're saying, Matt. So that's why I'm kind of trying to ensure I'm understanding exactly what Paul actually meant from scriptures. Yes, uh, thank you, Say. Uh, yeah, but I, uh, you know, uh, I, in those days, the, uh, you know, uh, the deacons, elders, bishops who were, you know, uh, uh, we need to understand there were more home churches, uh, smaller groups than you know, churches that were meeting in uh, larger buildings uh, and all of that. Uh, so, you know, there were more people who are leaders in specific uh, uh, small groups. And uh, so they were uh, kind of overseers, spiritual overseers, spiritual heads for the small groups uh, that they had. And they were also had this whole responsibility of teaching, of ministering uh, to the people. So it's not like just one bishop, one person that we're talking about, a bishop who is like, overseeing all of the churches uh, there, but we're talking about, uh, yeah, uh, you know, somebody who's a spiritual head, spiritual overseer, who's looking at small uh, home churches, uh, groups meeting at various pockets uh, in the city. And deacons as elders who are helping out in various administrative works in these uh, small home uh, churches or group churches. So where did this uh, our present day con concept of bishop come from? Maybe it came out of uh, uh, this whole thing uh, because they are spiritual heads, they are spiritual overseers, but in the context of what Paul is writing uh, to the church at Ephesus, it was uh, these categories that uh, we are, that I just mentioned. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Yes. But having said that, you know, uh, uh, we could even, uh, you know, these are some of the qualifications that we would even want in anyone who is uh, ministering in church, you know, uh, uh, pastors or evangelists or even bishops, uh, it's no different. But uh, here, uh, because it's small home churches, uh, look at the qualifications that are required for those who are overseeing uh, uh, that uh, that church or, uh, you know, that small life group or the small home group or fellowship uh, group, so to say. Yes. So the standards are high. Uh, the qualifications require the same. Uh, but yes, just a little difference in, uh, you know, how the terms are being attributed then and now. But no difference in uh, the standards that God has set for us. Does that help? It helps very, very well. Thank you. Because okay. I almost I almost kind of thought maybe was bishop, the office of a bishop also added later on to the fivefold office. But with this explanation, I think that has clarified it. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we uh, looked at um, uh, you know um, the qualifications that Paul lists out for those who are deacons. Uh, you know, Paul is saying, hey, you know, even as I said this to women, that they can't bring in their heretical teachings, they have to, uh, you know, uh, submit to man. It doesn't mean that any and every man, because they have, uh, you know, this authority of being leaders, anyone and everyone can come to leadership positions, take leadership roles and responsibilities, even if you desire, it's a good thing to desire it. But, you know, uh, these are qualifications that God requires, that the church requires uh, in God's governmental structure that he's established for the church. And he's telling Timothy also make sure, ensure that, you know, uh, you're choosing uh, such uh, leaders. And then we looked at uh, the qualifications for uh, deacons in verses 8 to uh, 13. Uh, so can somebody read that, please? Verses 8 to 13 quickly for us. Can I read, Pastor? Thank you, Asha. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to too much wine, not greedily for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with clear conscience, and let them also be 
test it first and let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Yes, verse 13, please. Yes, um, their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanders, but sober minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own household well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So here he says, you know, the deacons must be reverent. That means reverent about or have reverence to the things uh, or things pertaining to the house of God or the things of God. And then he uh, goes on to list uh, uh, the same qualifications that are required uh, of a bishop. Uh, he, he uh, you know, enlists the same things for a deacon as well. But uh, look at what he says in verse uh, 9. He says, you know, um, uh, he says, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. So once again, you know, Paul is repeating the importance of holding on to faith with a good conscience. And, uh, you know, in chapter one, he's uh, he's mentioned this twice. He's repeating this year in chapter three as well. It's the third time he's talking about faith with a good conscience conscience so you know your conscience must be clear your conscience will be clear when you live right before god and man and uh, you know what paul is trying to basically say here is even though your spiritual leaders mentors are not watching over you uh, it's your conscience that holds you accountable so some most often we don't have people you know and we are grown ups uh, you know we don't have anyone watching over us uh, like we watch over children constantly um, but nobody watching us but you know it's our conscience that holds us accountable for what we are doing in secret what we are thinking uh, our, uh, our lives in the secret so even though spiritual leaders are not always watching over us it's our conscience that holds us uh, accountable or will hold each one of us accountable and then in verse 10 he says but let those also first be tested and let them serve as deacons being found found blameless so um, like he mentioned for um, the bishops uh, you know paul apostle paul is telling timothy you know just don't give people leadership roles and responsibilities first when they come to church uh, not only if they're a novice means when they are new uh, but you know uh, first you know give them time to prove uh, who they are their capabilities their commitment their faithfulness uh, their attitudes their character you know test examine um, and then you know uh, 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 test and examine them by giving them small roles small responsibilities and look at their attitude see how committed they are how faithful they are whether they're able to do it well whether they're sincere and then you know if you see them committed faithful sincere having the right attitudes right character then put them in a place of leadership and um, responsibilities and verses 11 and 12 he lists the same important qualifications or requirements that he'll enlist for uh, bishops as well so i'm not going to go through it because i've uh, explained that uh, when we were looking at the qualifications required for bishops verse 13 he says for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, you know, I'm just adding a lot of new notes. So it's uh, some of the things that are not there in your notes. Uh, if you can follow, uh, uh, you know, the PDF that is uh, that I had posted, you know, if there's something that you like to, uh, additional that I'm saying, you like to make a note of it, uh, you can go ahead and do so. Okay. So here uh, he says that when someone serves well as a deacon, there are two things they obtain. They earn a good standing, uh, which means that, uh, you know, they come to a place of strength and stature before God and man. And they also uh, come to a place where they are bold, they're confident about their faith and who they are as uh, believers. So he says, you know, when you serve well as deacons, what is the end result? You have a good standing, which means you have a good place of, uh, you know, a strength, stature, a good standing before God and man. You're also growing bold and confident in your faith of who you are as believers. 
uh, who they who you are in Christ uh, and you know you have the confidence that you're able to provide leadership uh, and you are because you're in a place of strength to serve and he says why are you do you have this confidence that you are uh, you know you are able to provide leadership and you're in a place of strength to serve why he says because you have a good track record because your record has been good because you've been faithful and sincere and committed uh, to what you know has been entrusted to you and he says for those who have served well as deacons that means he says you know uh, remember that God sees your faithfulness he sees your commitment uh, he sees your hard work because ba basically uh, deacons even in um, uh, the early church you know uh, Stephen and Philip were deacons they were basically waiting on people on tables providing a uh, food ration for um, groceries for those who were uh, uh, widows those who were poor you know um, it was that this was their responsibility it was not a glamorous job like apostles going and preaching and teaching and you know doing science miracles and wonders but um, you know, it was just a, 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 a hard labor that these deacons were doing, like Stephen and the rest, you know, buying groceries, keeping a stock of it, uh, you know, rationing out things, providing food, handing over food to the poor uh, and to the widows. Uh, but yeah, in spite of this, we see that in the early church that uh, these men who were uh, deacons, you know, um, were flowing mightily in the gifts, in their calling that uh, uh, God had called them uh, to. So even if, uh, you know, uh, the job seems menial, like you might be just setting, uh, putting up chairs, you know, laying out the chairs, you know, stacking up the chairs after service. Uh, maybe you're cleaning, maybe you're um, doing some, uh, you know, serving tea or uh, you're just welcoming people. Uh, but, you know, uh, Paul is saying that when you do these tasks, which can be considered menial, you know, God sees your faithful uh, service. And then he says, the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So all the work of servant leaders in God's family, in God's church, you know, is pointing towards building God's people in faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So whether you are basically getting people to, uh, you know, uh, instructing people or guiding people where to sit or where to park their cars or their vehicles or serving tea, you know, whatever, uh, it's all pointing towards uh, building God's people in the faith, uh, which is in Christ uh, Jesus. And then after talking about, you know, uh, the qualifications required for deacons, uh, he goes on to talk about the proper conduct in God's house in verses uh, 14 and uh, 15. Okay, before we look at verses 14 and 15, has, anyone has any questions on um, verses 1 to verse uh, 13? Any questions? Or verses 18 to 13 that we just looked at? Okay, there are no questions. We'll move on to verses 14 and 15. So can somebody read that, please? Verses 14 and 15. Verses 14 and 15. It reads, Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Say. So uh, he says, these things are right to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. Paul desires to... Uh, you know, uh, uh, speak these things to Timothy personally, uh, but knowing that he might not be able to come as soon as he wishes or he desires to, uh, but he makes sure that he's writing all this uh, in a letter so that, uh, you know, time is not wasted, harm is not done, uh, things are set in order in the church and things are working smoothly in the house of um, God. And he says, you know, how he's writing these things so that Timothy can know how he ought to conduct himself in the house of God. So Paul's purpose for writing uh, was to give Timothy, uh, who is a leader, you know, practical information on how to run things uh, at the churches in uh, Ephesus. And look at how he uh, talks about the church here. He addresses the church as the house of 
um, God. So church must be a place uh, where God is. Uh, you know, that's what makes church more attractive uh, than anything else. It should not be a place where uh, the pastor, the, the, the you know, or the senior pastor, the, the person in charge is, uh, it's uh, where uh, he is magnifying himself or he's exposing himself or he's elevating himself or putting himself in a high position. But a church is a place where God is. And that is what makes a church attractive. That is what, uh, you know, would edify the church, would build up the church, the people in the church in their faith in Christ Jesus. So the church is God's house because He's the ar architect. He's the one who planned it, designed it. He's the one who's uh, uh, building it. He's the one who uh, is present there. He lives there. His presence is a uh, manifest presence is tangible, is evident. Uh, he provides for his house and it's a place where he's honored. Uh, it's a place where he rules his sovereignty, reigns, rules his uh, his sovereign will is done uh, so it is uh, the church is the house of god and also you know um, uh, the church is uh, the uh, the house of god in terms of a family house you know a house is where a uh, home is where uh, a family uh, dwells so it gives us another uh, idea about uh, the church the church is uh, the house of god where god dwells uh, where we saw uh, all of these characteristics why is it called uh, why is the church called the house of god but also it is uh, uh, you know uh, the family of god because uh, a home is where a family dwells and in the family there are uh, people at different across different age groups there are children uh, they can be preteens they can be teenagers they can be young adults they can be um, adults they can be older people uh, middle-aged uh, you know uh, uh, elderly uh, different ages so also in the house of god we have people uh, you know uh, uh, different uh, uh, different uh, age groups but also uh, in different uh, 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 you know seasons of their uh, growth in uh, in the world or in their relationship with christ so there can be adults um, uh, you know who are middle aged a little past middle age but they're still infants in the world still infants in their journey with god uh, or they can be young people you know who can be very mature in their understanding of the word and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, they can be grown up in their understanding of the concepts the things of god in their relationship with god so you know even as there are different um, uh, 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 sections or ages in a family and uh, you know we relate to to them differently you know how uh, uh, how i would relate to my father would be very different how would i would relate to if i had a child who's you know a three year old or four year old or a 15 or a 16 or a 18 year old and how would i relate to my grandparents who live uh, with us at home uh, so we relate to different ones differently in the same way you know in the body of christ in the church we have different people at uh, different uh, levels of maturity in their understanding the, uh, of the word of god and understanding of god we need to relate to them at their uh, level uh, accept them for where they are and build them up uh, and enrich them uh, 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 to where they need to be uh, take them to where they need to be so we need to be um, mentors uh, you know parents teachers whatever um, uh, be sensitive help them out uh, help them to um, grow and look at what he says also about uh, uh, the church he says the church is a house of god uh, and he says which is the church of the living uh, god so basically the word church the greek word for church is ecclesia which means called out so each one of us are called out for a specific uh, uh, purpose and uh, the same way you know each one of us are in a family called for different purposes have different people have different roles and responsibilities and we need all have to carry our different roles and responsibilities uh, in the same way in the church as a family you know we are um, we have different roles and responsibilities and we all need to do fulfill our god-given calling our god-given roles and responsibilities but also work together uh, 
uh, and not pull in different directions uh, with the vision and the calling that God has upon our church, just like all of them in the family work together in unity and oneness to keep the family as one united whole, one united, um, uh, keep them united uh, uh, and uh, keep them in unity. The same way we need to um, do that in the church because the church is uh, uh, the church of the living God because, you know, Ecclesia called out. We are called out. Uh, to be his people, we are called out to be the people of this living God. We are part of his family. We have sons and daughters, uh, and we are called out together to fulfill a specific uh, purpose. Um, and you know that's why he mentions Church of the Living God because we are called as his people. We are called together for a specific purpose, and we each one of us are called to fulfill that specific purpose and working together in perfect unity and oneness. And then he makes a very profound statement. He says, the church is the pillar and the ground of uh, truth. OK, uh, so ch the church is the pillar and ground, which means the church is the foundation of truth. The church is the upholder and the bearer of truth in the society. So we, uh, the church needs to know the truth, uh, you know, uh, be grounded in the truth, not just know the truth, but the truth has to translate uh, in, uh, in the way we speak the truth, where we live the truth, walk the truth, in our actions, in the way that we live our lives, basically in our uh, lives. But, you know, strategic, uh, sorry, um, uh, tragically, you know, many churches today don't value uh, the truth as they should, um, and they compromise on the truth. They kind of uh, uh, compromise uh, to the things of the world. They bring in, uh, you know, uh, worldly systems, um, uh, philosophies, ideas, way of doing things, accepting uh, different lifestyles, and uh, hence it's left. Uh, you know, many churches are left uh, very weak because their pillars are uh, uh, not on strong foundation because their ground is shaking. It's not built on the uh, truth. So Paul, you know, closes uh, this whole entire section by saying that, you know, he's talking about what the truth is, uh, which he mentions in verse um, uh, verse 16, and then he says that, you know, it's how important it is for us to embrace uh, this truth and uphold this truth as uh, a community, as ecclesia, as a people who are called out for a specific purpose. And even as we're called out for a specific purpose, it's so important for us to know the truth, to embrace the truth, and to live out this uh, truth. And he uh, goes to speak about, the uh, mentions this truth in verse uh, 16. So can somebody uh, please read verse 16? First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, please. Great indeed. Sorry. Go ahead, Sister Vinny. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Say. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. So uh, if you read this in the Message Bible, it says the Christian life is a great mystery, far exceeding our understanding, but some things are clear enough. He appeared in human body, was proved right by the vis invisible spirit, was seen by angels. He was proclaimed among all kinds of people, believed in all over the world and taken up into heavenly uh, glory. So, uh, you know, Paul is, uh, before he ends this whole section, he closes by saying, what is the truth? He says that the church is, in verse 15, is the pillar and the ground of truth and how we need to uh, be people who are upholders or bearers of this truth in society. And then he goes on to say what this truth is. And he enlists this truth uh, by quoting or, you know, a, 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 a hymn that was uh, sung uh, at that time. So he's uh, quoting a hymn which expresses the foundation of Christian truth. Yes, Mangi. Um, thank you, Pastor. Um, just um, this 
this him him now it will stand because uh, the message says that Muslim of Christian, of Christian, but here it says it's talking about God who came in flesh and. Uh, so, thank you. Is, Can you repeat that message? again, please? I couldn't get what you said. Sorry. Can you repeat that? Okay, I'm saying, I'm saying, Pastor, this him him here is 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 talking about God Himself who came as a human. So it's the mystery of of God coming to us as a human, and it's not about Christ, Christ, Christ about about us. So how how come uh, the message is saying that it is about uh, believers and not not God? So can you explain a little bit further about that? Where when where the the message Bible God is from being. It's speaking about God, and it's being about uh, believers. Thank you, God. No, but the message Bible is saying is this Christian life is a great mystery, far exceeding our understanding. But some things are clear enough. Uh, yes, he's saying that there are things that um, uh, we fully cannot comprehend or understand about uh, God, and that is why you know this whole. Uh, this whole uh, thing of false teachers trying to uh, understand things, how to receive salvation, how to be justified uh, by faith, and uh, you know, trying to find out their own ways and means of, uh, you know, explaining the Jewish laws, bringing it in, into the context of grace, uh, receiving salvation by grace to faith, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, for them, it's 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 uh, it can be very confusing for them. They're trying to find out things. Uh, it can be mysterious, and hence he's saying that they can may he might be saying hence there's there's a lot of false teaching. But you know, um, and that, and some of these things are so mysterious as far exceeding our uh, understanding, which means uh, you know what these false teachers are trying to bring teach about. Um, you know, salvation uh, by work, salvation by grace, and, you know, who Christ is, uh, Gnosticism, which I explained to you, uh, you know, uh, and all of those prevalent, uh, you know, cultic teachings, heresies that were prevalent at that time. Uh, so, you know, he's saying that uh, in spite of all this, you know, there are some things that are clear. And then he's mentioning the truth. He's mentioning the truth about the gospel. Did you understand it? Because the, the, the false teachers were talking about how to, uh, you know, you, how to live your, your life by works and not by grace. How to receive justification and sanctification or being righteous in God's sight by, gra by works and not by grace. Uh, so it's kind of confusing for many people because they were being misled uh, by lifestyle, but here he's saying that, you know, but there's something very clear and he's mentioning about uh, the truth, which is the foundation of the, of, uh, you know, the church, which the church has to uphold and build on. And once there's that solid foundation, the truth that is built on, it will translate into the life that we would live. Things will become, have more clarity about grace, about works and, you know, uh, which he goes on to talk in chapter four. Did that help, Mangi? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. But so he's much. basically here talking just about the truth about who God is, the foundation truth of the of the the church, and not of the foundation truth of lifestyle that he's talking about of believers. But translates into once you know the truth, it translates into your lifestyle. Yes, Sri Kumar. I just want to know, as you said, the false teachers who emphasize that um, you know um, uh, the the people should live on their works and it will they will be justified based on the work. But even uh, so, they are called the false uh, false teachers. So even there are churches now also they emphasize on the law and they say that um, you know the work is more important and the law is more important. So can we consider them as the false teachers now? Uh, is it like that? I just want to know that. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, and that is called legalism. When they bring in things that you have to do this, you know, in order to please God, to get things from God, you know, uh, uh, you know, living legalistic uh, rituals, doing legalistic ways of 
legalistic ways of doing things and following certain rituals, uh, you know, not because, uh, uh, you know, your love for God, which was what God was telling the Old Testament people, all the sacrifices that you're making, you know, you're not doing it with your, uh, with a heart of love. You don't, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's just a ritual. That's why he says, I will remove your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. I'll write my laws on your heart and my mind. The spirit will help you to keep uh, uh, the laws because it had become a ritual. It had just, so that's why God says, you know, you know, look at the animals that you're bringing for sacrifice. You know, uh, they are lame. They are sick. You know, he says, try offering this to your governors. Will they accept it? And he says, you know, uh, shut the door of the temple because your uh, your uh, your uh, worship is like noise to my ears. Your incense that you're burning is detestable uh, in my sight. Uh, so it had just become like a ritual that they have to do to please God, to keep God's wrath away uh, so that they they experience, uh, you know, they just receive his uh, blessings and his goodness and they, you know, uh, not his uh, curses or his punishment. So anything that is um, is not according to the truth is a lie, is, a, is, is something that is false, right? Uh, there's no, there's no in between. Uh, if it's not the truth, it has to be a lie and we know where the lie comes from. And uh, this lie can be so manipulative, it's so, it's so subtle, it can be so small in so small subtle ways, just like, uh, 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 you know, when, when Satan deceived Eve, uh, you know, said, did God really ask you not to eat from all the trees in the garden? You know, if you eat from the tree, will you surely die? You will not die. Uh, so, you know, what he said was uh, a partial truth. It was not, it was a lie in that sense. It was not the whole truth. You know, they will surely die, God said, but he said, you will not die. See, uh, so it just a simple thing like of, you know, eating something. Uh, which led on to various, you know, the downfall of the whole of creation and everything that God had planned. So here, when Paul talks about it in in, in First Timothy chapter four, he's saying these false these false teachers, you know, they're talking about you should not marry, you should not eat certain kind of food. You know, we can say, hey, these are so you know, so so small, so trivial. You know, uh, but uh, you know, Satan is using the small things to come to to just get into our lives that can corrupt the entire truth of uh, what you know the entire gospel is and can get a person totally away from their uh, uh, faith so yes if somebody is telling us you know uh, bringing about legalism it is a false teaching uh, it is not the truth so whatever you would like to call them you can call them but it is false teaching it's not the truth thank you pastor thank you yes say Yes, go ahead, say you have your hand up. Sorry, yes, I'm trying to get the mic on. Um, so yes, I, I just want to ask a question that um, from verse 15, uh, from verse 15 downwards to the last verse, uh, would it be correct to say that the subject matter um, in the Godhead that Paul here is referring to is Jesus Christ? Sorry, can you repeat that again, please? Uh, I said. From verse 15 down to verse 16, I said, would it be correct to say that the subject matter that Paul here is referring to in the Godhead is Jesus Christ? Yes, uh, he's basically talking about uh, 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 Jesus because the whole, um, uh, uh, you know, the whole Christian uh, faith as such revolved around the person and the work of Jesus Christ, what he had done, and that is what the disciples were teaching and uh, preaching. You know how God sent uh, His Son, how His Son came and uh, you know died on the cross. Peter's sermon, Acts chapter two, how you know um, how He was resurrected, how He, you know, we we saw Him, we uh, testify uh, of His works, of what He has done, and what He has said about the coming of the Holy Spirit. It, uh, and he's telling the people who had come there, you know, uh, on the day of Pentecost, who here heard the sound, uh, and who Peter was uh, preaching to. He's saying, "You are now, you know, uh, 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 you know, you are, you know, you are witnessing what um, was prophesied in Joel." 
you know, that uh, the last days I will pour out my spirit, what Jesus told us. Uh, so you are test, uh, you you are uh, people who are uh, a witness to the whole fact that you people, uh, you know, crucified Jesus, you people, uh, you know, put him to death, but he rose again. You know, we are witnesses to that. Many others have 500 plus are witness to that. And we, you are witnesses now to this truth that he said that, you know, the Holy Spirit will come upon us. And, and you are, uh, you know, you see that you're witnesses to that. You've seen it. You've seen and heard, uh, you know, us speaking in tongues. And uh, and that's why, you know, 3,000 of them were added uh, to that number that they went uh, 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 when Peter preached. So it's, it's the whole... Uh, uh, church as such, uh, you know, uh, grew out of this whole thing about the person and the work of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. Because in the Old Testament, yes, they had uh, an idea about uh, the Father. They knew the the, uh, the Spirit. Uh, they knew God as uh, uh, as Father, but they did not know Him as Abba Father, a very intimate relationship. And that is what Jesus came to reveal uh, the Father as Abba. And they knew the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they had a basic inclination to the whole uh, concept of Trinity in terms of Son, because uh, Isaiah chapter uh, nine, where Isaiah prophesies, he says, you know, for unto us a son is born. Unto us, uh, 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 a son, uh, uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders and you know, give the titles for the son. Uh, so basic understanding, but they didn't want to get into it because there was no clarity. But that whole mystery was now made clear when Jesus comes and all of the prophecies being fulfilled in him and the early church preaching. So it's, yes, basically talking about the second person of the Trinity, the whole uh, uh, you know, the early church was um, surrounded or, uh, you know, based on uh, the person and work of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, so uh, we'll move on. So this is basically in verse 16, he's talking about an hymn, uh, which is expressing the foundation of the Christian truth. And he says, without controversy, which means, uh, you know, the wonderful summary of Christian faith, you know, should be without controversy, which means, you know, this should, these things which he is and, uh, mentioned here in verse 16 uh, should be accepted without arguing or disputing among believers because there was a lot of arguing and disputing because of Gnosticism and various other cultic teachings. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's unfortunate when those who claim to be Christians you know, debate about these fundamental truths. It's very, very sad uh, because these are the core fundamental truths that we believe uphold, we need to uphold uh, and are basic to our faith. But we need to just believe this without arguing or disputing. So what are these truths? He says, you know, uh, God was manifested in the flesh, which means... Um, you know, that God, the second person of the Trinity, uh, you know, added to himself deity. He became a human being and thus manifested in the flesh, which means he made uh, a deity known. He made God known in the flesh. Uh, he was God in flesh. He, uh, uh, he revealed the characteristics traits or the attributes of who uh, God is. He was God manifest in uh, the human flesh. So, um, that's what uh, uh, the Apostle John writes, who came full of grace and truth, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only who came to us uh, full of grace and uh, truth. So, you know, Jesus manifested God in the flesh. Uh, he is God, the son who became uh, his deity, who became humanity. So he's 100 percent God, 100 percent man, fully God, fully uh, man. And, uh, you know, he lived his life here on earth and uh, people testify to it, witness to it. Uh, they've seen his death, his, resurre his resurrection, his ascension, uh, how he's alive, he's glorified. And, uh, you know, uh, they're preaching because they're witnesses of this um, and they testify to what they have seen, heard, uh, you know, uh, they are preaching this and they're preaching this without uh, compromise. And uh, Paul is saying, um, you know, we also need to uphold this truth and not compromise on this truth. So this is the truth the church upholds in the world. And then he goes on to say, you know, uh, who is not only manifest in the flesh, but justified in the 
uh, spirit. Now, uh, we might think this is a wrong uh, phrase to use, justified in the spirit, because Jesus did not need to be justified or made righteous because he was already righteous. He was already justified because he was sinless. Uh, he need not, uh, you know, uh, need to prove anything or need not uh, have anything to do to make himself righteous because he's already sinless, already perfect and holy. And that is why he could die for the sins of the whole world. But when we say that Jesus was justified by the spirit, not in the sense that he was once sinful and now is made righteous. No, that's not the right uh, truth. But in the sense that he was declared to be by the Holy Spirit what he always was, that he was completely justified before the Father. So he was always righteous. He was always justified before the Father because he is God. Uh, and it's not in the sense that he was once sinful and now made righteous, but we uh, look at this whole phrase in the sense that he was declared to be by the Holy Spirit as he always was. And how was he always was? He was completely justified before the Father. Okay. We'll stop here. We'll go for a break. And then uh, when we come back, we will take any uh, questions and then we'll move on. Okay. We'll thank you and see you after break.